So you can lose weight, but you're hungry all the time. And you're trying to starve yourself, your body, of fat and protein, which it needs. So diets that don't restrict only carbs will work, but they don't work as good as diets that restrict only carbs because they restrict foods that aren't fattening as well as the foods that are. Does that make sense? My question was going to be staying on an Atkins type of diet seems to me just as difficult. Staying on like an, yeah. Apple pie. Well, this is the I thing. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I make a great ice cream. You know, I just watched the finale of Top Chef. He made his ice cream with, what was it, foie gras? I mean, sounds awful, but you could kind of imagine it tasted pretty good. So that's how you have to do. I mean, one of the reasons people don't like this theory <laughs> is because it suggests that ice cream is less fattening than, like, you know, breakfast cereal because it's got all the fat in there. Well, 14 you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, here's, the, here's the thing. Carbohydrates make you fat, okay? That's what I'm saying, that it's hard to give them up. And life doesn't seem worthwhile if you're doing it <laughs> is actually irrelevant. It's unfair, and it's not only that because it doesn't make everybody fat. Some people can live on this stuff, and it's the same. I use the metaphor of cigarettes as a metaphor in my book. Cigarettes cause lung cancer. Nobody denies it, but actually, only one in ten smokers gets lung cancer. The other nine in ten can smoke their whole life and never get it. But that doesn't change the fact that for that one in ten, cigarettes may will kill them. And what I'm saying is not everyone gets fat from carbs, but for those people who get fat, it was the carbs that did it to us. We had to have a genetic predisposition, which is how sensitive we are to the carbs in the diet. Some people can deal with it. Some people can't. But if we can't, it's unjust. And because of the way it raises insulin, that's probably why we crave them and like them so much. You know, why I've never met anyone who said, boy, I could never live without brie ever again, or if I don't get my camembert, but it's like bagels, pasta, beer, you know, life cereal when I was a kid. So the part is, it's, it's unfair. The other thing is, it's hard to quit smoking, too, or quit, you know, alcoholics have a hell of a time quitting drinking, but it doesn't change the fact that we know that alcohol, for instance, causes liver cancer and smoking causes sick. So what I'm saying is, this is a problem. You know this is a problem. It's hard to stay on these diets because, and in fact, the, the more predisposed you are to get fat, the more you crave carbs. What I often say to lean people is we can't understand the cravings of somebody who weighs 300 pounds for carbs because when insulin's elevated, one of the things it does is it signals your muscle tissue to burn carbohydrates. If your body's running properly, insulin is only elevated when you've got high blood, when your blood sugar's going up. So if insulin is elevated, your muscles think your blood sugar is going up, and it tells them burn carbs and store fat and protein. So in effect, if you're overweight or obese and you're what's called hyperinsulinemic, you have insulin levels, for about some huge proportion of the day, carbohydrates are the only thing your muscles want to burn. They are food. So if you don't eat them, that's why you like them so much. The same way you can't, you know, starving a lean person of food is like starving a fat person of carbohydrates or whatever, vice versa. So that's why we crave them. And it's unfair, but the idea, there is plenty of anecdotal evidence from people who have given them up and like give quitting smoking or quitting drinking that you can get over it. And then suddenly you think, boy, I can't, you're sitting around thinking, how am I going to make that ribeye tonight? Am I going to barbecue it or sous vide it, you know? And am I ever going to figure out how to do the thing with the pan? You, anyway, um, <laughs> you get the point. It's like, it is hard. And this is the fundamental difference is calorie restricted diets fail, I say, because your body adjusts, whether you go off of it or not. Carb restricted diets fail because people fall off it. If you continue not to eat fattening carbs, your body will work. Although for some of us, because of the damage done, there's no going back. So the best study ever did, the best information on this came out of a British physician who treated about 1,500 obese patients with low-carb diets from the late 50s through the 70s. He said about 25% of his patients seemed to stay on carb restriction and didn't work. Or they lost, you know, they were 50 pounds or 100 pounds overweight, and they only lost 20. And the longer they'd been obese, the more obese they were, the older they were. Women more than men, because women have all this estrogen stuff that's a 
drag, like you guys are programmed to store fat some of the time, and then it, you know. So for some people, it works better than others, but that doesn't change the fact that the reason we're fat to begin with is because of the carbs, you know. So it's sort of, this I'm arguing is the best you could do short of some, somebody coming up with a miracle drug. And I would even say that bariatric surgery probably works because it gets you to restrict carbs, mostly. Why is it that you're getting so much resistance now that when it's been 40 years to see the effects of the Atkins diet? It's really what you said is just the English practitioner. People think it's quackery. I mean, I literally, I was out at, I've got a piece coming out in the New York Times Magazine in two weeks on sugar and high fructose corn syrup. And I was out at the uh, University of California, Davis, interviewing a guy named Peter Havos done some of the best research on sugar and high fructose corn syrup. And Peter believes that low fat diet, that basically carbs cause, uh, excuse me, fat causes obesity. High fat diets cause obesity. And I was talking to him about this, and he does, he studied all this stuff. And as he explained it to me, there's one study he finds convincing, which I don't, but that's what happens when people disagree. One study. And he says, you know, actually when you secrete, when you eat carbs, you secrete insulin, and insulin and the carbs stimulate the secretion of a hormone called leptin from your fat tissue. And leptin is then felt by your hypothalamus, which suppresses appetite. So as he explained to me, people lose weight when they eat high-carb diets, low-fat diets, because you, again, you secrete insulin, which stimulates leptin secretion, which suppresses appetite in the ventromedial hypothalamus. I said, OK, well, what happens when people go on Atkins diets? And he said, oh, they get bored. And there's not a lot of food to eat, so that's why they lose weight. And I says, let me get this straight. Uh, the high carb diets, uh, insulin, leptin, hypothalamus, you got all that, and Atkins diet, it's boredom. Do you see a certain difference in effort that you've put to explain the two possible? And he actually said to me, I don't care what happens in the Atkins diet, it's irrelevant to me. He thinks that some, you get into some, this whole state that you get into called ketosis, you know, ketones are an appetite suppressant, there's all these myths about the diet. I've had very, you know, successful uh, people who might win the Nobel Prize someday telling me, oh, uh, you know, the diet uh, works. It's just not enough food to eat. You know, you don't have enough choices, so you can't, you know, you end up eating less, and that's why you lose weight. And I said, well, look, there's this famous experiments done in the Second World War by this guy Ansel Keys where he starved conscientious objectors to see what happens when people are starving. And by starving him, he gave him like 1,600 calories a day, which is a lot by today's standards. You know, that's when you go on a diet, your doctor wants you to eat 1,600 calories. But these people were obsessed with food. I mean, one of them actually cut off his fingers with an ax so he could get out of the study. But the whole Keys wrote these two volumes of the biology of human starvation. It's like 3,000 pages total. And it's page after page about how obsessed these people were with eating and food from the moment they started being starved. And their diet was like cabbage and brown bread and a little bit of meat every day. So one of the things I point out in good calories, bad calories, is hey, can you imagine a duller diet? A more boring diet. They didn't have any choice. They also got some, you know, um, boiled potatoes. And yet they would have killed for an extra boiled potato. And yet when you go on the Atkins diet, and all you could eat is eggs and bacon and foie gras and, you know, meat and brie and camembert and cheese and you could cook duck and goose and, you know. There, there's such a limited quantity that the boredom suppresses your appetite and you lose weight. The medical community has created this entire mythology around this diet. And in part, they did it because they had to get rid of the underlying biology on which it was based. Atkins read the same stuff I read. I mean, he didn't get it all right. He made a lot of mistakes. But this mythology is so profound, it's so with us today, that very smart people completely disagree on, on just, even if you, like I said, even if you just bring up the name, it's quackery, it's meaningless, it's some, like it's some dietary parlor game. And everything you might, it might have to teach you is irrelevant. Yes? I, I like what you said. I've been inhaling your comments like that. Uh. Unbelievable. And what you said about how people were jealous of the money he made, and yet how Harvard Business, or how, how, pardon, Harvard Medical Center. Yeah, I actually, I mean, I interviewed a lot of the people who knew Atkins from the 60s. 
and they all grew up together. All these guys who, there were like there were half a dozen people who controlled the field of obesity in the 60s, particularly the 1970s. It was a brand new field. They all knew each other. I mean, it was a, the, the ultimate boys club. And they all knew Atkins and didn't like him. <laughs> and they thought he was a jerk. And they were jealous of the fact that his book made like millions and millions of dollars. And they said as much to me. And remember I said the Harvard Nutrition Department was primary, like the people who every time this low-carb diet came up, they squad, you know, slapped it back down. And the Harvard Nutrition Department in 1960 they had a brand new building that was funded by General Foods, the makers of like Tang breakfast drinks and like 18 different dried cereals. And the head of the Harvard Nutrition Department, a guy named Fred Stair, was basically bought and in the pocket of the sugar industry, which was um, exposed in the 1970s by Ralph Nader, and it was a huge embarrassment for Harvard. And these people, I mean, I don't think all of them, like Jean Maier, I think, you know, was an honest guy, but it's just every time somebody was shooting down these low-carb diets, it was somebody from the Harvard Nutrition Department, which was just taking it, and Stair believed that his job as the head of the department was basically to get industries to contribute money to them and to make industry happy. And actually, I'm now working with a, a woman from uh, Denver who's been doing some, uh, getting internal sugar industry documents, and Stair was actually getting money from the food industry, from the sugar industry, to fund anti-tobacco, I mean, pro-tobacco research by friends of his. I mean, it's corrupt the department as you could imagine, and yet, you know, if they weren't there, all of this might have been accepted 50 years ago, and we wouldn't have an obesity epidemic today.